Now, deposition on coasts uh, can create beaches, spits, tombolas and bars. Now, there was, um, I think it was like an eight mark question last year on spits. And it was, I, I found it a really hard question because how can you write an eight marker about how a spit is formed? Um, so I highly doubt one will come up on spits this year maybe tombolas and bars it's worth looking at them but i doubt spits will come up in much detail in this year um basically what happens you have a coast um you've got a beach here which is yellow stuff prevailing winds blows the um well causes longshore drift and the uh, sand or sediment is transported along the cliff um well the coast now, when it reaches like a bay, um, the the like sand sediment it continues going in the same direction, uh, causing like a gap uh, behind it, and salt marsh is uh, is is created behind. Um, now, the only time a spit can really be formed is if um, like the water there's like water blocking the way, so. Because otherwise, the sand would just continue and it'll meet up with another bit of the coast. But it physically can't go any further because there's a river, um, which is stopping, which is stopping it from continuing in that direction. A bar is exactly the same as a spit, except for the fact that there is no like river, river or other water source getting in the way of it going in that direction so it just continues so the sediment continues to transport and travel until it hits another headland and creates a lagoon behind it a tombolo is again very very similar um except instead of joining up with a headland it joins up to another island so guys, of course we have a case study on this and our example is the Holderness Coast. I'm pretty sure the Holderness Coast is like the fastest eroding coastline in the UK, um, which causes real, real problems for people living on the coasts and all that. Um, so a few different strategies have been put in place to try to uh, slow this process down or stop it from causing any damage. Um, and there are two methods used, hard and soft. Now, hard is when it's, like, not natural. It's, like, man-made. Um, and it, it looks it looks artificial. So you have groins, uh, which prevent longshore drift. Because if you imagine uh, longshore drift sediments just going in one direction and it's keeping going that way, groins basically get in the way of that and stop it from going any further. Um, this is really good because it's really effective, but the only problem with that is it can actually make um, erosion really much worse down the coast. What you need to get in your head is that with any type of um, defence against erosion, it's always going to cause problems much worse um, uh, down the coast and have a knock-on effect. So this has to really be considered when making flood defense. Well, not flood defenses. Um, coastal erosion defenses. A sea wall is also put in place. You see these in Blackpool, um, and basically what it does is it's like a curved, uh, a curved like barrier on the coast, and what like waves will crash against it and be flicked back into the water. But again, this causes other erosion downstream. Rip wrap is when you get lots of like rocks and you just put them against the coastline and it stops um it stops slumping and it's just sorts out. It probably looks a bit better than groins in a seawall, but probably has the same effect down down the coast. Now, soft engineering is uh, very different to hard engineering because it looks it looks natural, and um, the only problem with this is it's much less effective, and it doesn't last very long time. So, beach replenishment is when you just put more sand on the beach. So the sand gets taken away, you just put a bit more sand on. Obviously, this isn't 
solving the underlying problem, which is that sand is still being taken away. Um, but it does look natural. Sand dune regeneration. Uh, this is when you see these sand dunes and you see all them like that plants coming off them. These are actually there because they um, they keep the sand in place a little bit, so it takes more effort from the sea to actually uh, take sediment away. Um, with all of these methods, one thing has to be uh, considered, which is the cost-benefit analysis. So if you've got um, a patch of land or like a building worth a million a million pounds on the coast, and it's going to cost you five grand to put up a seawall, that's you know that is uh, the benefit outweighs the cost. Whereas if you have one house on the coast and it's going to cost you know, half a million pounds to put up a defence, it's not really going to be worth it for the sake of one house. So the cost-benefit analysis is really important. Right, let's talk about weather and climate. So the difference between weather and climate is that weather is a day-to-day -day, um, like condition. So one day it might be sunny, one day it might be rainy. That doesn't mean that that's the constant climate. The climate is the expected condition in an area. So... The climate of uh, the UK is temperate, so it's it's not it's warm, but it's not it's not hot by any means. Um, now here are a few different examples of weather. You have temperature, precipitation, humidity, cloud cover, and wind speed, um, which all show all show the weather. In the UK, uh, it is. Uh, really hot it's summer um in june this is because we are in the like cancer bit of the earth that's where um the sun is shining now in december it's going to be much cooler because it's winter because the sun is focusing on capricorn now the climate of um, an area or a country is going to be determined by a few different factors. So the distance from the sea. If if you think, um, here is uh, the coast. In summer, the sea is actually going to keep it cooler on the coast because it's been cooled all winter and it's just it's it's just cooling. It's cooling the coast down. But in winter, it's just been summer and the sea has been nice and warmed up, so that's going to keep the coast warm. So basically, the coast um, has like a more consistent temperature all year round. Uh, prevailing winds uh, bring weather from areas that they've passed. If they've been over a really hot, dry desert, that's the weather they're going to bring with them. If they've been over a really cold, wet sea, that's, you know, that's the weather they're going to bring with them. Relief, if you're on a really tall mountain it's going to be freezing up there because there are like less air particles whereas if you're on like a lower patch of land it's going to be warmer so we have things called anti-cyclones um now this is when you see calm weather uh, it's nice blue skies the air is sinking uh, but it's got high pressure on the tropics and clouds can't form so just remember these points these are key features of an anti-cyclone a depression is very different it's windy and rainy uh, air is rising low pressure so those two are co completely op the opposite of an anti-cyclone and it's very cloudy now looking at records from the UK's climate, we can actually see that it's changed a lot over time. Now this is one reason a lot of people don't believe in like global warming because although the temperature is on the up right now, we've seen that in the past it's gone back down and it's been up and down throughout history so it's very difficult to say 100% um, that it's going to keep rising. Uh, in the past we saw there was a mini ice age uh, where actually the river Thames um, froze over and think about how massive a river that is, it must have been pretty cold. Here is a little diagram which um, it shows you all the different types of like uh, climate or temperature we can receive uh, based on sort of what's around us um the uk is like in the middle of a of like a lot of countries and um this means we get a real real mix of of weather uh so wherever the wind is blowing from that's what we're gonna uh, receive 
here is a picture of the Earth, which shows um, the different cells uh, that circulate around each part of the Earth. So we'll start at the top. And at the bottom, we see polar cells. This is where you've got like the North Pole and the South Pole, um, and it's going to be it's going to be high pressure, cool air. Now, um, feral feral cells, um, they are seen like next, so they're not by the equator; they're uh, like on the tropics. And the Hadley cells are in the middle. Now, we have things called ocean currents. The one you would have heard of is North Atlantic Drift. This is really, really important because what this does is it circulates um, sort of, well, around us, the UK, uh, circulates like warm, warm water around us, which keeps us warm, um, which is really important. So we have something called the Coriolis effect. Uh, this, is, this shows that um, he actually... Uh, changes location because uh, it veers to the right the idea is that um, air rises this hot air rises and the earth continues to rotate underneath it when it sinks back down it's going to hit a different part of the earth so just to show you guys that here's a ball imagine that some heat is rising off the ball and the ball rotates and it heat and the heat sort of sinks back down um, you can see it's landed on a different part of the Earth. So that just shows you that right there. Uh, here's a little uh, thing you need to know. It could come up as maybe like a one or two marker, I don't know. Um, the boundary between a feral cell and a Hadley cell, as you can see there, um, uh, creates... Oh, wait, no. No, my bad. A feral cell and a polar cell. That there. Um, creates strong winds, so just make sure you got that noted down. Um, now, how do we know that climate has changed in the UK when we weren't actually there to test for it? Well, we have like three main things that we can see. Well, actually, actually, it was four, but the three main ones are ice cores. You extract a bit of ice. Um, from like well ice and you can actually see uh sort of what was what was chilling in there and it shows us how how hot the climate was or how cold the climate was uh tree rings um the number of tree rings in a tree show us how old the tree is and if the rings were thicker it was a warmer year because it's um it's grown more so uh, it's, the tree's got thicker in that year. And if the rings are thinner, then it was a cool year because it hasn't grown as much. Pollen records um, from, like, if it was a spruce shows that it was a cold year. And uh, if sage was grown a lot, it was probably a warm year. There's loads of examples you can use there. But if we think about it, um, we can see what plants grew when and, you know, that shows us because a plant that survives in warm conditions, if that was there, then it was probably it was probably a warmer time. Um, now there is one more, which is like um, like records from people, like diaries and journals. This uh, this it's not as like scientific, but I suppose it does work as well. So like pictures, we can see that the uh, River Thames at one point was actually frozen over. Um, okay, one sec, my cat's just. Being an idiot. Natural causes for why the climate changes, there it's not just random. Um, so we've got the Milankovitch cycle. Um, uh, there's the first stage is precession, where the Earth's axis actually wobbles. So temperature, climate, it's not always consistent. Eccentricity is the orbit. Now, um, the Sun, no, no, the Earth doesn't orbit the Sun in like a circular motion even though people assume it does it's actually more of an oval so if you think when it's on like the long side of an oval so let's just say let's say that this is a sun it's not it's not in proportion um and this is the earth when it's here it's quite close to the sun so it's going to be hotter when it's here it's actually quite far away so it's going to be cooler and that that's uh, eccentricity then we have the axis tilt it's between 22.1 and 24.5 uh, degrees. 
um, which shows, I mean, that's actually quite a big difference. So again, the climate changes through that. Solar variation. Uh, the sun gives off more heat at some times than others. So it has sunspots. So like this is a really good example. This is now the sun. Um, imagine the black bits on the sun are like sunspots. So the heat from the sun actually can't get through them and it can only get through the white bits of the sun. So that shows you that um, certain areas of the sun give off more heat than others. Volcanoes. Um, when volcanoes erupt, sometimes ash comes comes out of them and this actually blocks the sun's heat so it's going to be a lot cooler now we do have the greenhouse effect don't get confused and say humans cause the greenhouse effect that's not actually what it is the greenhouse effect is completely natural and it's the idea that um the atmosphere uh, that surrounds the earth sun comes into the atmosphere and it gets reflected out and it sort of it sort of stays in in that atmosphere and keeps the earth warm. It can't completely escape. Um, and like so, like a greenhouse, the sun like goes in and it stays in and keeps it warm. But it's said that humans do speed this up through carbon emissions. Now, the human causes of um, of climate change are enhanced greenhouse effect. This is. Uh, the human enhanced greenhouse effect, so carbon emissions and pollution um, speed up the process, and trans and that comes from transport, factories, farming, industry, etc. Um, also, farming if we're deforest if deforestation occurs, there's going to be less trees. Now, trees are actually known as like uh, carbon catchers because they take in carbon and they replace it with oxygen, so they're like they're our source of trying to keep um, the greenhouse effect down a little bit. And if we're cutting them down, then then we're, we're not helping ourselves. Cows also produce methane, um, and that's that's a greenhouse gas. Uh, the effects of global warming, because why is everyone getting so concerned about it? Well, sea level sea levels are rising because the polar ice caps are melting, and that's why all these like polar bears are like going extinct, which is like really sad. Uh, less crops are going to grow because the conditions are going to be more extreme, so it's not going to work for many crops. And glacial retreat is like something about snow. Uh, now let's talk about tropical cyclones. So, um, uh, tropical cyclones form when we have low pressure and the air is rising. That is very similar to a, de a depression where the air is rising. They form over the sea. It's really important that the sea is 26.5 degrees or over. If it's below, they physically, they don't have the energy to form. Um, if they're going to form in the north of the Earth, it has to be between June and November. And if they're forming in the south, between November and April. Um, so let me focus. Basically, you have um, like the eye of the storm. Uh, now, the eye wall is where the strongest winds are. The eye, it's pretty chill in there. But the eye wall, it's like all the strongest winds because closest to the eye. Now, um, the root of it uh, is down to the spin, so the Coriolis effects. Um Basically, they form in the sea. They have loads of energy from the heat. Second they hit land, they lose their energy. But because they, they've brought all that water with them and that energy, it still affects the land and um, it causes a tropical cyclone. Um, now, if we have our Earth and we split it into like this, anything in the south is a cyclone. If it's in the top left corner, it's a hurricane. If it's in the top right corner, it's a typhoon. Now, the impacts of a tropical cyclone is high winds, which can cause damage, you know, things blow away. Storm surges is like when the water's like, su like surging through the land. Intense rainfall, which is going to cause flooding and coastal flooding. Landslides also occur, which is when like things start sliding away down the cliffs. You could get a question, which is like, 
um, how does such and such a country respond uh, to like a tropical cyclone? What you need to know is that if it asks you for a rich country, the responses are much better and much quicker, and this is because they have the money to deal with it. Whereas a poor country, so an emerging or well, yeah, an emerging or a developing country, then their response is going to be much slower and it's going to be worse. They're going to rely a lot more on charity because they don't have that money to um, sort it out. Now, how severe a tropical cyclone is is based off the Saffir Simpson scale. So level one, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty normal, not too bad, 74 to 95 miles an hour. T- level two, a bit worse. Level three, pretty bad. Level four, it's getting quite crazy. And level five is like ultimate tropical cyclone, 157 miles per hour plus. That is pretty nasty. Um, now, We use Cuba as our developing or emerging uh, country. It's a poor country, so if you get a question on it, use Cuba. Our developed country is America, um, and that's a rich country. Is America even a country? Yeah, I think it is. Um, Now, drought. I I, I highly doubt drought will come up, or at least I think for... um, I think it came up as a a developed country. So... I can't, I, no, I honestly can't remember what I came up with. But I remember drought came up as like an eight marker last year. So it probably won't come up, but it's worth covering anyway. Um, now, there's a difference between drought and an arid area. People think, well, some people think that um, a desert is in drought. It's not because that's just its climate. This is similar to weather and climate that we were talking about earlier. An arid area is always dry. However, a drought is an unexpected time of low rainfall. So when the UK is suffering drought, it's because we usually have quite a lot of rainfall and if it hasn't rained in ages, then we're, you know, we're a bit, we're a bit like, oh, it's, it's not rained. So that's drought. There are two different causes of droughts. You've got meteorological, which is changes in the weather, and hydrological, which is water stores in the ground. Um, Human causes of drought. Dams, uh, less water goes elsewhere. So, um, obviously, dams, it's like water's collected in uh, one area. That water has to be taken away from another area, so there's going to be less water stores there, so they're more susceptible to drought. Deforestation, um, no transpiration is going to occur if you've got no trees. Trees hold um, trees hold water, and um, without them, we just we'll just have drought because it'll just soak away. Whereas in the trees, it'll it'll go into the trees and come back out of, into the clouds. Uh, agriculture, irrigation, people just throwing water away at their plants to um, make them grow. It's actually going to cause us to run out of water quicker. Now, our case study for drought, we have the Ethiopia drought. Uh, Like I said earlier about rich and poor countries, Ethiopia being our poorer country, it's going to be much more difficult for them to cope with drought. Uh, Now, their dry season is longer than usual. Um, that's that's when you have a drought. So uh, our case study uh, for a rich country is California. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So guys, the equator is where um, you've got like hot and wet conditions. Uh, there's more evaporation there. Like I said earlier about um, things like air rising, the earth rotating and stuff, basically what happens is this this hot air rises and it sort of sinks onto the tropics. So the tropics are much drier, um, whereas the equator has that hot and wet um, environment. So, guys, let's talk about ecosystems now. Now, um... In our ecosystems, we have a biosphere, which... Now, the biospheres are the parts of land, sea... So you probably can't read that because, for whatever reason, my camera's just not focusing. But a biosphere is the part of the land or sea and atmosphere in which organisms are able to live. So which biosphere resources do we use in our everyday life? Um, Now, we have two different types of resources, abiotic and biotic. 
pretty clear in the name, the biotic is living. So remember that the opposite of that is abiotic and abiotic is non-living. So we use soil, sun, water, air, temperature. These are all non-living. Our biotic resources are animals, plants and fungi. They are all living organisms. Um, now... The warmer the climate, the faster the nutrient cycle. The nutrient cycle is when um, nutrients on the ground, so here you probably can't see it, but it's like a picture of a cow. Um, let's just say that cow died. That would be really sad, but let's just say it did. And it decomposes into the soil, and then the tree soaks it up and it's all sorted. Well, that process is a nutrient cycle, so if it's warmer, that's all going to happen so much quicker. Um, now ecosystems in the UK, um, right, that, you might be able to read that, um, so we have woodland, um, which is mostly deciduous, uh, moorlands, bogs, uh, heathers, peat, wetlands, low nutrients, uh, can be drained, um, and heathlands, so sandy or marshy lowland locations. Um, now marine ecosystems. Uh, we have a salt marsh ecosystem and offshore habitats for wind farms. What is eutrophication? I can imagine this coming up as like a one mark and everyone be like, what the heck is that? So you might want to like know what this is. Um, Fertilizers, fertilizers damage habitats um, so can cause fish to die and algae and all that stuff. So if you remember, eutrophication is damage from fertilizers. It's a bit of a weird key term to have in there, to be honest. Um, now, tropical rainforest. In tropical rainforests, we have deciduous trees. So that's talking about the different life cycles. Now, um, what... What's so good about the trees in the rainforest is that they're really adapted to the really hot, wet conditions. Uh, they're tall because they're all competing for the sunlight. You have the emergent layer, which is like the tallest tree. You'll have like one tree, just, you know, cream of the crop. It's, it's above all the other trees. And that has competed for the sunlight and it's closest to the sunlight. So it's going to grow the tallest and it's going to have the most nutrients. They also have buttress roots, which they're really shallow roots and um, they sort of come out of the ground a little bit, which is different to the ones we have in the UK. And this means that the nutrients are, um, are soaked up really quickly because, like I was talking about the nutrient cycle earlier, if it's hotter, nutrient cycle is going to be quicker. So the nutrients don't go very far because they're soaked up straight away from the surface. So the cycle is fast. These are different layers. So you've got the emergent layer on top, um, which is that one tree just chilling over everyone else. You have the canopy layer, which is like the bit where all the leaves are. The understory, which is underneath all the leaves. The shrub layer, which is like your bushes and all that stuff. And the forest floor. Now, this is the reason um, why the rainforest is so biodiverse, because there's so many different layers, so so many different habitats for different animals. So guys, here we have a little triangle, um, three different processes in the nutrient cycle. So you have biomass, that being like the trees. Now the trees litter their leaves onto the ground. Um, these uh, decompose into the ground, they transfer all their nutrients into the soil. Uh, you have a few different processes as well, so you've got soil leaching and surface runoff. Uh, you can look at them in more detail. But the nutrients in the soil are taken up by the plants and the process continues. Now, uh, soil. Warm, moist conditions. Perfect for weathering bedrock. So, here is your soil profile. You have the roots, the soil and the bedrock. Um, yeah, that's basically it and that green thing is like your plant sorted biodiversity I explain this um 
briefly a second ago, but it's the range of living organisms that live in the same area. So the rainforest is good because it is warm and wet, which suits a lot of different organisms. And also because of all its different layers, it's really good. Um, so why is the rainforest so important? Well, it provides us with two things, goods and services. Um, now the goods being... Uh, Water supplies, drugs, oxygen, timber, uh, food. So, what this goods are basically like, like treasures, little treasures that it has. So, like objects that we can actually physically remove from it and use for different things. Service is slightly different. A service is sort of, it's not like a physical thing. It's, um, Examples being basically homes for indigenous people, uh, flood prevention, tourism, carbon captures and biodiversity. What this basically means is like a service is what it does for us rather than what it gives us. Um, so just make sure you know that, the difference. Um, now, now, climate change is really quite bad for the... Um, for the like rainforest because it's increasing the temperature which means many different organisms are going to struggle to survive so the biodiversity is going to decrease which is like really sad um this actually means the leaves aren't going to grow back as quickly so there's going to be less transpiration um so it, it's not going to be like as wet all the time it could actually it probably won't go through drought but it's going to lose that wet that wetness um which is what a lot of the organisms really like um now um we can see that climate change is gonna um it's gonna cause like the rainforest to have to adapt so trees are gonna become like fatter this is because they need to store the water um so it's not lost as it's getting much hotter they really need that water storage there's going to be less vegetation and the rainforests are going to be less dense. Now, if you get asked about deforestation in the rainforest, there are a few different sort of methods or reasons for it being done. A lot of people deforest for space so that they can ranch uh, like cows, cattle ranching. Um, slash and burn, Tavi. Now, slash and burn is really, really bad because it's not even like the wood is just wasted and um obviously the it, it it releases carbon into the atmosphere so it's literally they're not even using the wood for like materials or fuel they're just burning it down for space so that's something you could say about it it's also used for logging which is a little bit better it's cut down and it's actually used for materials now let's move on to the deciduous woodland now the trees and everything about it is quite different the leaves are broad um for instance in an oak tree uh the different layers you've got the canopy layer and the herb layer so it's going to be a bit less biodiverse than a rainforest because you've got two layers uh mild winters warm summers um it's quite rainy now, it has deep roots because nutrient cycle is slower, so the nutrients are deeper down. They've had more time to soak into that. So here is your nice little so soil profile. Now, um, oak trees are large and strong. They have broad leaves, deep roots. Um, a lot of insects uh, live there. Uh, they also have ash trees and birch trees so if they they asked us last year and i literally got this question wrong i could have said any tree and i think i said like spruce or something um just say like oak tree or ash tree or birch tree if they ask you for a tree from a deciduous um forest just just say that so the animals we get in the deciduous woodlands we have swallows and you see them um you see them every year moving to Africa when it gets into winter. They don't like the cold weather, so they just they just fly to Africa. Um, now, uh, a lot of we have a lot of animals that hibernate, so sleep through the winter. That's how they survive the cold months. And uh, some animals, like squirrels, bury nuts so they can survive throughout winter when um, there isn't as many sort of nuts around. Um, now, the goods that we get is 
um, fuel, timber, and we also get non-timber forest products. Uh, services, tourism, I mean, I really don't know anyone who would want to go to a random forest and pay money for it, but clearly people do. Um, conservation of animals, carbon catchers, and camping. Yeah, some people want to go camping, that's, that's fair enough. Um, now, climate change, we're going to have milder winters, so winters are going to be a little bit warmer. Uh, increased risk of drought, um, that's because we... Uh, I don't know what that is. Um, increased risk of forest fires. And that's because it's a bit bit hotter, so things are going to dry out quicker. I remember, um, like, last year we had lots of problems on the hills because the grass um, was really dry, which meant it could catch fire really easily. So the forest fire risk is going to increase. Uh, a monoculture is only replanting conifers. Conifers grow really fast. So your oak trees, they're going to take hundreds of years to grow. Whereas a conifer, you know, it may be 10 years. It's not going to take very long to grow. So you're going to find a lot of the forests you go in for walks, all the trees are like the same kind of trees. You don't really see many oak trees these days. Um, now we have, uh, I think the final case study of today pretty much is the new forest. Uh, the New Forest is pretty uh, near the South Downs, actually, but it's on the South Coast. It's a national park owned by private landowners. Don't get mixed up and think that National Park is owned by the government. It isn't. It does have protected laws, but it's owned... Um, different patches of it are owned by private landowners. They just have to follow rules. Um now, the aims of this national park are conservation and education and promotion. So not only is it conserving uh, animals and habitats, but it's actually making this sustainable by educating future generations about how important it is to conserve um, the environment. So we use it for tourism, timber and housing there, the uses of this national park. Um, the problems with it is that tourists do damage wildlife with litter. You could get a question on sort of conflict. Um, so why do tourists have conflict with farmers? Because they might they might be littering. That's one example. Um, barbecues can start fires. You want to go for a nice little camp trip and you start a barbecue. It could potentially start a fire. Um, cars hit animals, which is a bit of a gutter for an animal, and visitors trample plants. Um, just they do, don't they? Um, now, how do we manage this? Well, we use pesticides and herbicides sparingly. Um, yeah, we replant deciduous trees so you don't have that monoculture and... Uh, managed by the forestry commission so you might have um like clear designated parking areas um no like a camping area and all that stuff they have different signs you might see in a uh national park um here's a practice question i think explain why some people who use the new forest might oppose moves to encourage more tourists to come to the region um that i'll just leave that one with you so you can think of it so yeah there are a few notes now uh river physical processes um let's quickly talk about this so uh one um landscape that can be formed is oxbow lakes um these uh i think we could get quite a big question about like oxbow lakes i think having said that we did get a question last year about meanders so we might not but it's worth really knowing in quite a bit of detail so the narrow neck of the meander is eroded and the water takes the quickest route which is the outer bend deposition takes place to seal off the old meander and Oxbow Lake is left behind when the meander is fully sealed off. Um, there's plenty of videos out there as well that further explain this process and might make it a little bit easier to understand. Transportation in rivers is the same as it is in the sea, um, so just make sure you're comfortable with that.
So guys, thank you very much for watching this uh, Jog Through a Vision video. I hope it helped. Things I'd recommend looking at in a bit more detail would probably be um, rivers. I haven't covered them in much detail in terms of the physical processes. So uh, like waterfalls, I think that could come up. So make sure you know a little bit about that. And um, that's really the main thing. But uh, good luck in the geography uh, exam, paper one, and keep revising.